Uh, Lean on Pete uh, is a new movie from Andrew Andrews, uh, the writer and the director. Very nice to see you, by the way. From Andrew you. Andrews? What? You said from Andrew. Andrew's the writer. Sorry. That's no, from Andrew. I know, I know. From, sorry. Who's here. Yes. Comma. Comma. Full <laughs> Andrew, stop. New power. Yes. Andrew's... He's the writer. Sorry about yeah. this. It's all right. How are you, Andrew? I'm very good, yeah. Are you I'm excited? Good, I am excited, yeah. I mean, having the movie out rather than... No, I'm right. excited to be here. Right. This is okay. an exciting thing. So, Can uh, I tell you at the beginning, I really like this film. That's good. Just so you. we're all on the same page. It would be pretty awful if you hated it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was no, but I don't. Hang on, I haven't said what I think yet. <laughs> no, that's fine. Can and I just say, I really love this film. Can Please. I just say, I really liked it before he did. I literally said to Simon before he saw it, you're going to really like this film. And Mark was absolutely right. Anyway, tell, so sorry. tell tell us about Lean on Pete, because there's lots to discuss, but tell us about this movie uh, and tell us about your two stars, really. So it's about a young 15-year-old kid called Charlie... Uh, Thompson. I can't remember his surname. Charlie Thompson uh, played by film. Charlie Plummer. Charlie Thompson played by Charlie Plummer. Charlie spelt differently. It is spelt differently, it's true. And it's a story about him and he comes to Portland with his single dad and to a suburb of Portland and they have very little money and the dad has got a new job that's kind of keeping him away a lot. And Charlie ends up working at a local racetrack essentially to do something with his days and earn a bit of money to get some food on the table. And while he's there, he, uh, I suppose, sparks up a friendship, essentially, with a kind of pretty beaten down racehorse called Lean on Pete. And that is the beginning, I would say, of, of the story. And and who is the guy who's uh, who's running the horse at this time? It's Steve Buscemi, who's a... Who else? Who else? Who else? Could you imagine as a, as a grizzled horse trainer? So, uh, tell us, and uh, just explain a little about this horse racing, because this is American country horse racing, which is, this is not the glamorous uh, world of horse racing that you might see on the, the television. This Just explain what this world is like when you go to one of these meets. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, I didn't know anything about it. And essentially, the, the racing that Lean on Pete does is quarter horse racing, which is essentially sprinting. They do 100, 200 yards, 300 yards. It's a very short distance racing. And there's very little money involved. It's certainly not glamorous. And, you know, I spent a lot of time at the track that's in, that's in the movie. And there are a lot of people that have worked there for years, generations of people, but they are earning no money. It's a very difficult existence for them. Like the jockeys themselves are earning 70, 80 bucks a race. So it's really a hard kind of like scrabbling together money existence. Uh, but it's a fascinating one, really interesting. So this uh, this comes from a novel, uh, which you read. Is it, is it Vlautin? Vlautin? Is that how you say it? Vlautin, yeah. Willie Vlautin's novel. So you're reading this on a plane. Um, at, what, at what stage in this novel do you, do you get, like, is it like page 30 or page 107? I mean, at what stage do you think, hang on, I... I think I could do something with this. It was pretty soon into the novel, I think. It just really affected me, essentially. And I kept, like, you know, crying <laughs> as I was reading the novel. And it just really hit me in the gut, I think. I just really felt this the life of this kid and I so desperately wanted to help him essentially it's almost like you wanted to reach through the pages and look after him and just give him a hug and say Do you know what it's going to be all right just kind of keep going um and that just really broke my heart I suppose and the journey that he goes on and how tough that is and how resilient he is in the face of such kind of suffering I suppose so the, and the film has some, uh, lots of stunning images but mm. is, is that in the book I mean did you was it all character stuff that you wanted to do or are those vast uh, vistas there on the page. Yeah, they're on the page. And I think what it was, I mean, it's interesting to me because, you know, for me, those vistas are just the environment that Charlie is in. Like, that's always the key to me. So it's far more about that than it is anything else. And they are beautiful, but to me, they're almost terrifying in their vastness to this kid who's just abandoned, essentially, out in the middle of the desert. And around him is this kind of vast nature, which instead of being beautiful is just kind of, you know, it's like a weight on his shoulders. Um, and, I mean, it's hard when you're in that environment. It is so beautiful and Stunning, so you want to kind of reflect it, but it's all in all a lot of that is in the novel about how Charlie feels within that environment. Two, rela two related questions. Sorry, just no, sorry, before, you go ahead. Mark uh, comes in. First of all, about Charlie Plummer himself, and then I want to ask you about the horse because they are sort of obviously lean on Pete is the horse, sometimes referred to as Pete uh, throughout the film. But just so Charlie Plummer, we might have seen him in in a couple of movies, but essentially he he's very young and he's in every shot pretty much. I mean, it's his picture. How sir, how did how did you find him? How sure were you that he would be able to carry a movie like this on his slim shoulders? I was terrified. Like, looking when you do a bunch of auditions, it's, you know, I met a lot of really good kids. 
But I was nervous because I knew that he is, as you say, in every single frame, I think, of the movie. He's there somewhere in that frame. And he sent us a tape and he was just so good. I could immediately tell. I was like, I said to the casting director, he's the guy. There's no way he cannot be the guy. He looked like how I imagine he looked. He had a face that felt both kind of vulnerable, but there was some strength to it. He seemed the perfect age, not quite a man, but not a small boy. And he was just so subtle and incredible. Um, and you'd seen King Jack, presumably. I'd seen King yeah. Jack, which he's really, really good at yeah, that. But brilliant. I hadn't actually seen it until I saw his tape. Right, right. But he's amazing in that. He's he brilliant. Yeah. The thing that he has, um, I'm sure everybody said this. So I'm sorry for repeating something. That's in. The thing that he has is he has a touch of the young James Dean. It's partly in that the lilting voice, you know, the kind of the, the softness and the vulnerability. It's also in that the fact that he has a face that telegraphs expressions. Because although there is, you know, there's very good dialogue in the film. There's many quotable lines. You know, you can only fall down a certain number of times. All that, so you know, never let go of the rope. I love all that stuff. But actually, the story is told so much of it through his facial expressions. And particularly when you're working in a landscape that's like that, I know that the way it's framed is very much keeping him the centre of the image so you're not getting distracted by the scenery. But it's, his, he has a face that the camera is absolutely drawn to. And you said this thing about he, wherever he is in the frame, you're always drawn to him. That is, I think there is a touch of James Dean in there. I think it's true. And I think it's what you say, it's that vulnerability. And I think a lot of like young actors don't necessarily have that vulnerability. And I love that in performances anyway, a sensitivity of vulnerability. And he really has that. You can see this like pain, I suppose, behind his eyes. You can see everything going on behind his eyes. And I... Working with him, I know this sounds odd, but it really did remind me of Charlotte Rampling in a really strange sense. They have a similar kind of quality in the way they are look on screen and how they sort of draw you in and push you away at almost exactly the same time. And I yeah. love that, that kind of tension. In and we should say, because you worked with her in 45 years and we had a lot, lot of fun with uh, Tom, Tom Courtney, Courtney when he came, <laughs> came on the show and talked about the end of the film. Like yeah. literally the only thing he wanted to talk about was the final scene. And we kept saying, you know, just in case people haven't seen it. And he went, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, what happens in the final scene? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't he say Pisces? Pisces rules the feet or something like that? Pisces rules the feet, yes. He must have talked about his dog Stanley too. He always talks about his dog Stanley. I don't remember I don't that. Remember he was that. too busy on the feet and the end shot from 45 years. Yeah. Anyway, but, but on, just, just just on the... On the before, before we lose track of the horse, um, this might sound like a really stupid question, but do you... How do you cast the horse? You know, this isn't just any old horse. It felt like the horse had passed an audition as well, or the horse looked like Charlie, or the horse was sort of um, looking down at the ground a lot and was sort of embarrassed and awkward like Charlie. I don't know, maybe this is nonsense, but... No, that's exactly what happened. That is exactly... You auditioned the horses. We auditioned the horses. We had four horses and there were lots of big, like, sturdy, proud... They're all queuing up. ...masculine all horses. And then there was a little scared one at the back that was Starsky. He refused to look at us in the face. And I was like, that's the one we have to have. That's the one standing at the back looking a bit, like, shy and sensitive. And there was also something about his eyes. He's got more white in his eye than other horses we auditioned, if that's what you want to call it. And supposedly you are drawn to horses when they have more white in their eyes. I think it could have been right. to do with that right. but it was definitely there was something like lonely about him and it did seem to reflect something about charlie it's, yeah. wor it's worth saying sorry, sorry we keep, so we keep my sorry, final we're both point keen. my final point and then mark is going to i'll shut up run things for a bit it's worth i just think it's worth saying it will be the yeah. point that mark's going to make it's worth saying this is not a boy on a horse movie you know this is people the way we're talking about they might think okay i've, I've got the handle on this let's just say you haven't <laughs> It's true. And I remember it is, I didn't quite realise that until I finished making the film. And I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. And I would say to people, oh, it's a, about a boy and a horse. And they would kind of go, oh, God, that sounds like awful. <laughs> is that like a weird family movie with talking horses and happy, lovely endings? And I was like, oh, God, no, this is going to be a problem to try and promote it. So, yes, it's not really a boy and a horse story. The thing that I, I really like, I mean, I'm, I really enjoy the film. The thing I really like about it is that there are a number of characters who are deeply flawed. You know, whether it's Steve Buscemi's character who is a chancer, who is, you know, working his horses into the ground and then disposing of them, you know, sent to Mexico, which becomes a euphemism, or whether it's Charlie's father who, you know, yes, he's... A, but there are... All of them are seen completely three-dimensionally and they none of them are seen as, as you know, wholly good or bad. And what, some of my favourite scenes are the scenes between... Charlie and his dad, in which there is real affection, in which his father is is giving him advice. I mean, even whether it's a thing about the waitresses, not his father is giving him advice that feels tender and loving. And you, we've seen that character so many times in American movies of the father who's sitting on the porch with a can of beer and he's aggressive and violent and all the rest of it. And you didn't get that. I thought that the 
best thing about it was that it was open-hearted to all its characters. It didn't, even the Steve Zahn character, nobody is solely vilified. Yeah, and that was really important to me. And it is there in the book. And what I love about Willie Lawson's writing is he's very compassionate about people that are, you know, leading difficult lives. And that was the thing, especially about the dad. You're right. I've seen so many dads who are just violent alcoholics. Yeah. And to me, I wanted him to be, he's not the great dad in the world. He's like more like a big brother to Charlie, but he loves his son, but he's not good enough. He's not doing enough to help his son. So it's complicated. Nobody is all bad and nobody is all good. You know, everyone has been driven to making certain decisions because of their circumstances. And that was always really important. Let's play a a clip from the film. This features uh, Charlie Plummer as Charlie, Steve Buscemi as Del and Chloe Savini as Bonnie. So what do you like to do, Charlie? When Del here is making you do all his dirty work. I run. I play football. At school? Yeah, but not yet. I played in Spokane. I was on the freshman team. We won eight games in a row. What position? Corner, and sometimes wide receiver. But I'm too little to play anything else. I'm waiting to lift weights until I stop growing. I haven't grown in six months, so maybe six. Why'd you move to Portland? My dad moved here for work. What's he do? Can we not talk? I ain't talking to you, I'm talking to the kid. I was tired of talking to you 15 minutes after I met you 20 years ago. <laughs> I had to go. Just tell it like I see it. So Steve Buscemi, he's hardly in that clip, but he, he makes you smile, doesn't yeah. he? As soon as he starts to speak. Um, I just wonder, people listening to, to Charlie Plum, is that, is that his natural speaking voice? Is that the way he talks? Is he doing... I think it's action. quite similar to that. I think he's he's there's a slight lilt he's doing to the voice, uh, but he does. He's got like a, he's a really kind of there's this kind of gentle lilting nature to his voice that is that he does sound like. One of the lovely things about that clip is uh, in the dialogue, it's it's not so much what's said as what's not said. The lovely thing when he starts talking about you know yeah I, I played football and suddenly he's kind of that's it and you realise that the the backstory of that is that he can't because they keep moving and therefore he can't get to the end of a of a season when he's playing football but he, but they don't actually have that discussion they have another discussion in which it's to the side and I think that works really well I love the moment when he's told you know do something else before there's nothing else you can do or before you can't do anything else but I still think that the greatest moments of it are the moments of science I wonder whether how difficult it is not to be seduced by that landscape you know you've made films which have got a very kind of particular um sometimes you know like an interior air and suddenly you're in the middle of this this and it'd be very easy to just go you know it's America let's just go wide and let's you know yeah it is it is tricky and and you know we the first thing we decided was to make sure that Charlie's always in the frame. So it's not just about showing a nice cutaway of a beautiful landscape. It's like, how can we show that this landscape is reflecting something about the character? But also, the truth is, it is really big. <laughs> and it is really wide. And it's very interesting to me, like, when the film came out in America, nobody really mentioned anything about the landscape, because, of course, they're used to it. They're used to it being big and wide. But I think from a British perspective, it's like, oh, my God, it really is enormous in comparison to what we're used to here. Yeah. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I find environment fascinating and I find how it makes us feel fascinating how it can make us feel scared or alone or nourished or whatever it is it's quite amazing to me so I was going to say the other thing is very quickly is that you you have a very sparse use of music you 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 you're kind of somebody who doesn't ladle on music at all. I mean, I was I'm making notes and saying that there's no music, and then about halfway through, okay, and there are little bits. But you're very careful about it, aren't you? Yeah, I am really careful. And this was actually the first time I had any kind of score written for it. Usually in my last films, there's no score. Just so diegetic. Yeah. yeah, exactly, playing. And I'm always a little bit, I always don't like it. And I actually don't mind it in other films. I think it's fine. But for me, when I put it on my own films where I'm editing, it suddenly feels like it's doing too much work. And I feel like the imagery anyway is quite, fragile I suppose I quite like the fragility of some of the images and if you put too much music it seems to overpower it in a certain way and I love soundscape so as much as I can like do music with sound and with sound yeah. you know the backgrounds the more you know I'll use that uh, j- uh, just a comparison again with 45 years was that was a short story that was a short right? story yes. so when you when you adapt a short story are you putting loads of stuff in to the story and when you're adapting a novel 
as you are here, presumably you're spending a lot of time taking a whole bunch of stuff out. Yeah, which was tough because, you know, the first script was about 300 pages, you know, and the, the film is a decent length anyway, and you can't, I could, this film couldn't be four hours long. Um, and it is tough. It's like there's a lot of great stuff in the book that you just feel like you have to remove. And Willie, the writer of the novel, was really helpful in that. I would send him drafts of my script and he would be like, you know what, I don't think you need that, even though it was a really important section to him. So it was really, really useful. Um, so it is just about like fine tuning the story to kind of fit to what it is you're trying to say and what I feel like Charlie's ultimate journey is about and what he's searching for. So I tried to make all the stories relate, I suppose, to that. Was there, he, sorry, was there ever a moment in which somebody in the studio said, to you, it's great, can you change the title? Yes, all the time. <laughs> and well, actually, and I thought that as well. You know, I was like, oh God. And then I sort of forgot about it. And then it's hard because I know what the film is and I know that the film is just the name of the horse. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's like, oh God, I'm not making it easy. <laughs> a boy and a horse and a sentimental sounding <laughs> title. It's like, oh God. So, well, what yeah. were they suggesting? Well, nothing. That's the problem. No one really had Avengers any other suggestions. Avengers 5 is apparently a big choice, yeah. Well, that would have certainly got the people to go and see it. <laughs> There'd be a bit of a shock. <laughs> uh, what are you going to be working on next, Andrew? I, mean, I, I don't know when you finish this movie. It seems hard to be asking you already, but what's uh, what's next on your slate? Yeah, I've got a few films that are sort of coming together, and I'm doing, uh, uh, fingers crossed, a limited series for the BBC, actually, that should be shooting early next year, and that is set on a... 1840s Arctic whaling ship. Right, wow. so you haven't had enough of animals then. So now I'm doing whales and polar bears and seals. Wow. You're going to get... <laughs> We're gonna, we've got this wildlife f- film. Who should we get? I know. Andrew Hayes. <laughs> get that guy who made Lean On... What was it called? The horse, Avengers he, 5. He get loves him. animals. He does horses and whales. <laughs> He's our guy. Andrew, thank you very much, Steve, for coming in. Thank you uh, very much. We all love Lean On, Pete, and wish it uh, wish it all the best. And Charlie Plummer is just something else. Isn't he? Altogether. 